know, God performs miracles for people of faith. God performs miracles for people of faith. The faith chapter in your Bible, as you know, defining faith and discussing it at length is in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. I want to go to Hebrews 11 and verse 32. Hebrews 11 and verse uh, 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. You'll be hearing more about that today. Quench the violence of fire. You'll be hearing more about that today. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And I'll stop there. Today I'm going to talk about seven encouraging miracles. Seven encouraging miracles. I want to go back to the time of Daniel. You know, when I was a boy, there was a movie that I really enjoyed as a child called Slaves in Babylon, and it covers the events that I'm going to talk about today. I've not seen that movie, I think, since I was a boy. I'd like to see it again sometime. Also, when I was a boy, there was a very popular religious song that maybe some of you have heard about this time in history. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego threw them into a fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Do you, uh, any of you remember that? If, especially if you grew up in the African-American com community, you would have probably heard that song. Haven't heard it lately. Maybe we can have a revival of it. But today, I want to go into, the, uh, into seven encouraging miracles that occurred during the time of Daniel and during the time of those three young men that uh, people used to sing about and maybe still do. I want to go to Daniel, the uh, first chapter, and give the background. Now, I'm not going to cover thoroughly all seven miracles, but I want to cover the first and the seventh a little more thoroughly and, and at least list the others. So let's first go to the book of Daniel and the beginning of it. In the third year, uh, this is Daniel, the first chapter. In the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. This is 606 B.C. The book of Daniel covers 70 years of his life, roughly, from his teenage years when he was uh, taken captive to near his death. So he's a teenager in the beginning of the book and, and in his 80s, perhaps late 80s, at the end of the book. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to pronounce it American style, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. So Daniel is of the nobility of Judah. He's uh, of the nobles and those who would be associated with the monarchy. So, of course, his book points to the ultimate monarchy, the king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Young men in whom there was no blemish but good-looking, <coughs> excuse me, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. He wanted to educate these young men to serve him. He wanted talented men. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank. So he's taking good care of them because he wants them to be his servants. <clears throat> and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now you know them more by their Babylonian names. But uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and of course Daniel. He also had a Babylonian name, but he's much more famous by, as Daniel. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. <clears throat> but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. 
scholars uh, debate what's going on here. <clears throat> Here's what I understand as of now. I believe that Daniel was concerned that the food he was going to be getting there in the, in the Chaldean court, much of which would, would have been forbidden food. If you understand uh, Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. But uh, I think if he had turned the food down but accepted the wine, it would have been considered inconsistent or weird or hypocritical. You know, you're turning down th this fancy food, but yet you're drinking the wine. So he decided, I think, for consistency, to be wise as a serpent, as harmless as a, as a dove, as the Bible in the New Testament says, and to say, look, I just want vegetables and water. I want a basic diet. And this gave him the opportunity to therefore not have to deal with the forbidden foods that the king was, w w wanted him to eat. And I, I think that's wh what the point is here. So he decided to just forego the wine and the food uh, because that was, I think, the wisest course of action in order to achieve his goal. N now God had brought Daniel into favor and, good, and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king. <clears throat> who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. Uh, these are the four people involved now, Daniel and his three friends. So Daniel said to the steward, Hamelzar in the Hebrew. So this is unlikely to be his personal name, but this is the steward, Hamelzar. So the Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. A challenge, a test. Would God bless them and make and, and give them you know robust appearances so that they would not have to be dealing with this unclean food so he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days and at the end of 10 days their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies oh so this is a miracle how encouraging daniel's in captivity he's in exile he lives his whole life in exile, and yet within that exile, he rises higher and higher as Joseph in Egypt. Joseph could never become technically the ruler of Egypt, but he became the second in command under Pharaoh. Daniel, as a Jew, could never technically run the Chaldean Empire, but in some sense he did, for, uh, for a time, bec become virtual uh, manager of that empire, at least a very important uh, part of it. Uh, again, in captivity, and yet blessed in captivity, encouraged. <clears throat> so, and, and thus it is also with the Christian. We are, in a sense, in a spiritual exile. We're not running the world now, nor should we try. But uh, we can live in the world and be very greatly blessed uh, as Christians within even this civilization. Verse uh, 16, Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that, were, that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. This is a side point, but remember, Moses was highly educated. Paul was highly educated. These four men were highly educated. So, God can use anybody. He can use somebody with very little education, but God is in favor of education. You know, and we, we, we need, we, if we have the opportunity to achieve a great deal in terms of training and education, go for it. <clears throat> anyway, verse 18. Now, at the end of the days, by the way, there's education and there's indoctrination, obviously. There's a difference. There's a difference. Verse 18. Now, at the end uh, of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, brought in the chief of the eunuchs brought them to, before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king inter interviewed them, or he spoke, you know, talked to them. And, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. So they, they had what it takes, or what it took back then, you know, probably what it still takes. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Then da thus Daniel continued into the first year of King Cyrus. So this is an overview of about 70 years 
uh, of, as I said, of his life in service to the empires. And then when the empire was replaced by another, the Medo-Persian Empire, he continued in his role there. So the miracle, I would call it the, the miracle of the diet, the dietary miracle that God performed. You know, water and vegetables, and he looked healthier in every way, he and his young, and his young friends, than uh, the, these others who, who were evidently compromising uh, in order to, you know, live literally probably high off the hog in the literal sense. You know, they were probably compromising too much, and yet he, they, these four were the healthiest. And they were also the most talented of these young men coming up to be trained uh, to serve the king. Now we have a, another miracle. Here are two miracles, ladies and gentlemen, who are listening. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He demands that his wise men, if they're so great, tell me what, what I dreamed. Or if you're in Britain, what I dreamt. And uh, they couldn't. <laughs> How could they, could they read his mind? They said, tell us the dream and we can interpret it. But he said, tell me the dream and interpret it. Well, Daniel supernaturally was given the dream. He could tell Nebuchadnezzar what he had dreamed. And then beyond that, he was given supernaturally the ability to, to interpret it where Nebuchadnezzar knew this rings true. And uh, so he had two miracles. Number one, knowing what Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed. Number two, knowing the interpretation of it. Well, this, of course, rose him to great prominence. So now there are three miracles. And then in the third chapter, no compromise with idolatry. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would not bow to the idol, the golden idol, and uh, were thrown into a fiery furnace and survived miraculously. And there's so much to that account, and at some point perhaps I, I can uh, wax eloquent about that account, but that's another miracle that God performs during that time. So here are people in captivity, and yet how encouraging it must have been to the Jewish captives in Babylon to hear of these events. Now we come, so now this has been f uh, four miracles so far, right? Now we come to the fifth miracle in Daniel 4. Nebuchadnezzar has another dream, a vision of the future, and Daniel uh, interprets it for him in a very effective way, and it becomes a prophecy of what would happen to Nebuchadnezzar. And it also is a prophecy, frankly, for future history that I could cover at another time. So once again, a miracle. God miraculously gives Daniel the, uh, the uh, prophetic vision to interpret a dream that he had given to Nebuchadnezzar as a prophecy for Nebuchadnezzar and for uh, the Gentile uh, empires that would rule the world until the second coming of Christ. So yet another miracle of Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's second dream there. Now we come to Daniel, the fifth chapter, and the famous account of the handwriting on the wall. Mene, mene, tekelu farsin, the handwriting on the wall. By the way, uh, what I, uh, m m much of this is, is in the Aramaic language, the international language of that empire, a language written with the Hebrew alphabet, but yet a different language, similar to Hebrew, but yet different. Uh, but much of Daniel is written in that Aramaic language, which was the language that Jesus Christ spoke as a conversational language in his time. But anyway, in this fifth chapter of Daniel, he's able to read uh, the, what is written there. I don't think that's necessarily miraculous. That may just be, a, a, you know, that he had the, the understanding of how to read it, uh, may, maybe based upon the fact that he knew what, what, what the interpretation was. So it's kind of a package deal. He read it and explained it. He explained that where nobody else could explain what this handwriting on the wall meant. And even though it was a tragic prophecy for Belshazzar, the, the ruler of Babylon at that time, even though it was a tragic prophecy, he knew it was true. What he didn't know it was, is it was going to happen to him that very night. He was so overconfident that I, he, he knew that somewhere down the line it was going to happen. Uh, and I suppose it was, it was a very scary thought. Maybe he thought somehow... Even though it was, it was told he, he was told it would happen. Maybe he thought somehow by 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 giving honor to Daniel or by knowing about it, he could do something to prevent it. But it happened that very night. So Daniel told him about it, and it occurred. But Daniel had such a reputation that even though the empire fell, the Neo Babylonian Empire, the Chaldean Empire, even though it fell and was succeeded by the Medo Persian Empire, Daniel's reputation was such that he continued to be a, ch a chief advisor to the new ruler, Cyrus, and under him, a ruler that the Bible calls, 
whom the Bible calls Darius the Mede. So now we come to a, a seventh miracle. So we have the miracle, the dietary miracle. The, we have the miracle of knowing Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the miracle of interpreting it, the fiery furnace miracle, the miracle of interpreting a, a, another dream of Nebuchadnezzar and prophesying, and then the miracle of uh, reading and interpreting and prophesying regarding the handwriting on the wall. Now we come to miracle number seven, and I want to read about that in Daniel, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> It, ple uh, it pleased Daniel, I'm sorry, it pleased Darius. Now this Darius is ruling under Cyrus, uh, the great ruler Cyrus the, uh, of the Medo-Persian Empire. He places a man the Bible calls Darius the Mede, and scholars debate who, who this was. <clears throat> but the Bible calls him Darius the Mede. So it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these... Uh, three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Oh, so now we have competition, you know, politics, dog eat dog, you know how it goes. We're in a political year as I speak to you now. I hope that this, this overtime can help people even beyond this year, that this message might still be available even in future years. But in this particular year that I'm giving this message, we're at the beginning of a very intense political year in the United States. And so we all have, much of, many of us have politics on our mind. So here we have the, the cutthroat world of politics at that time, people angling for, for power and trying to get, you know, get rid of Daniel. And I suppose anti-Semitism is also a factor here. So the governor and satrap sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Let's read between the lines and speculate. Maybe these people were, did not have the same integrity of Daniel. Maybe they were, they were more corrupt, and uh, so they didn't want their little games <laughs> being exposed or shut down by Daniel. The, I would think that has something to do with this. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. We've got to, he, we know him to be a devout Jew, and that's going to be his, if you don't mind my using a mythological reference, that'll be his Achilles heel. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king, and so you see this was a conspiracy of several against him. So I have a feeling that they were maybe involved in some abuses that they didn't want exposed. That's my speculation. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said uh, thus to him, King Darius, live forever. By the way, you need to watch out if you're a big shot for flattery like that. Are you a VIP? Are, is somebody listening to me? Are you, an, are you an exec? Are you an important person? Are you in charge of something? Even if you're not so important, but maybe even in charge of a small group, beware of people who are flattering you all the time. Verse 7, all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that, uh, that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. <laughs> so they were appealing to his vanity, and big shots like that can be appealed to that way. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed. See, they were counting on, on, his, on the fact that he would sign it, and there was a custom in that society that once something is signed, you can maybe write some other decree to invalidate it, but that particular degree cannot be in, a, a decree cannot be invalidated. It cannot be. Uh, it, the law of the Medes and the Persians, as it says here. Let me read it. Now, O king, establish this, the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Let's go back to Psalm 55 and verse 17. Psalm 55 and verse 17. This is a verse you ought to consider memorizing. Evening, morning, and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Do you eat three meals a day? Most people do. I would recommend you pray three times a day. 
not I don't mean that that's all the praying you do, but to have to, to have a sense that three times a day to make sure that you have prayed. Um, and Daniel prayed three times a day uh, f- toward Jerusalem. And so we see his focus was on the work of God. It was on the place where, from where someday the law will go forth to all the world, the place where the temple will one day stand, the, the place where Jesus Christ will, you know, from which Jesus Christ will one day rule, Jerusalem. And he prayed three times a day facing Jerusalem. Let's go to Matthew 6 and verse 10. You see what you can do? They call this sometimes more bang for the buck. You have Daniel 6.10. Let's connect it with Matthew 6.10. And here we have a model prayer by Jesus Christ. And what does he say in verse 10 of Matthew 6? What should we be praying about? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, so Daniel prayed facing Jerusalem, looking forward to all those prophecies which even in his day had already been made about the future of that city. And so we tie it in Daniel 6.10 with Matthew 6.10. When you pray three times a day, include this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I now go on to Daniel 6.11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you... O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So they wanted to deify the king. And uh, unfortunately, many rulers want to be treated as gods. The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show regard for you. And I think, as I said, there's a little bit of prejudice here uh, implied. Or maybe a whole lot. <laughs> O king, let's go back. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So he had too much confidence in these other advisors, didn't realize they would try to undercut a very good advisor, Daniel. You're supposed to be working as a team. Why would you under, want to undercut the most talented member of the team? So he was a bit naive about these other people. And he didn't realize what he did was going to expose Daniel to harm in this way. Now he's stuck because the only thing he could do is write another decree. But and on what grounds can he do it? What's the basis for that? Then these men approached the king and said to the king, No, king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. They really had him, uh, we could say, the metaphor over a barrel. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. What a horrible death. What a horrible decree in the first place. I'm thinking back on what I read in verse 7. What a horrible decree in the first place to do something like that to somebody just for praying to another god. you know. But somehow they convinced the king to go along with this, I guess because for one thing it was only for a month. But still, you know, I guess he figured anybody could hold off praying to his own particular god or goddess for a month and just look to me. But uh, Daniel could not. Daniel had to pray on a daily basis, three times on a daily basis. And here he risked his life to do so. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. So this was the hope and prayer of that king. Wow. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it. And evidently the den was something that kind of went downward. You could go down, down, deeper into the den. Maybe it was like on an incline, and the lions were kind of on the the bottom there. Then a stone was brought and laid on them, and I guess they did that so that they wouldn't just suddenly escape if you should open it. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring. This is what you did in those days. You, you, you had a, like a clay, and you, and you made a, a sign, and then you know, it would harden, and you'd have that sign there that, that, uh, of your particular um, impression, you know, and the king had a royal impression, a royal sign. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, 
And the king lay, uh, sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet, signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. So he felt like he had to do this for his own credibility, for the credibility of his empire, and yet he was extremely displeased. He loved Daniel. Yet he, uh, Daniel, of course, was his best aid, his right arm in a sense. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. So he genuinely you know, regretted this decision. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. So you see, he continued his respect for the monarch. You know, the monarch had uh, really made made a fool of himself, but, you know, hopefully he learned a lesson from that. Then Daniel said to the king in verse 21, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. What a, 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 again, a, a, this is now in a way the capstone. What a wonderful miracle for Daniel, for God's people. I mean, the people at that time it would, it would have been heard. And of course, now it's in the Bible for us to read about. Very inspiring, very encouraging. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no inquiry, sorry, and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. Daniel was a man of faith. God honored that faith. He was a man of courage. God honored that courage. And the, now notice what happens. This is often what happens. When you plot against somebody else and try to get somebody else in trouble, you know, the Proverbs tell us, you know, that you'll fall into your own trap, you know. Fall on your own petard, is that the expression? And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before them, before, I'm sorry, let me, go, let me go back and read this again. And the king gave the command, and they brought these men who had accused Daniel, and they cast him into the, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. I guess these lions were, by that time, rather hungry. And Daniel had been there all, all night, and they weren't able to do anything about that. And so now these people come and the lions move, go up and as high as, as far as they can, as high as they can, and get them as fast as they can and devour them very quickly. So they quickly were done away with, the men and their families. You know, so this, is, this was a lesson to the rest. Back off now. Quit your plotting and scheming against Daniel. And maybe, for, for that matter, quit your hatred of his people and of his religion, of his way of life, his God. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. So he was a polytheist, but he understood that Daniel's God was the greatest and uh, that Daniel's God should be respected. So we have, as a result of this, greater respect for the people of Judah scattered throughout that empire, uh, a vulnerable minority. Now they had uh, the protection and blessing of the monarch. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. So a very wonderful lesson for that ruler Darius to meet under Cyrus. And so Cyrus would have also heard about all this too. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Miracle number seven in this, in this book. Verse 28, 
So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus of Persia, you know, who remained, uh, of course, as the chief ruler over that entire empire. And probably this was very short, shortly before his death. But in the meantime, now that we've established the great credibility of Daniel as a man of God, we now have prophecies of Daniel to conclude the book, which project uh, from the Old Testament, which are a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So this Daniel, who was uh, of the of royalty, who served in a secular role as an advisor to, to uh, monarchs, to emperors, uh, also was given a prophetic gift that bridged the Old Testament uh, to the New Testament. And let's be encouraged and inspired by these miracles as we read about them. And let's now go to the book of Ephesians, the third chapter in verse 20, in conclusion. Ephesians 3.20 now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's be inspired by these seven encouraging miracles. <laughs>